protected areas around the world perform important roles for life on Earth. From huge wilderness areas to relatively tiny city reserves, each is a powerful reminder of our natural heritage and our duty to protect it. But for many endemic species, those found only in one geographic area, these arcs of conservation are their last stop before extinction. So how do these parks protect such rare animals? And who helps champion and support their survival? This is the story of the Nango Spiny Skink. Hi, I'm Dan Ferguson from the Department of Environment and Science. I'm here today to talk to you about the critically endangered Nanga spiny skink. It occurs just outside of Gympie in southeast Queensland. So the Nanga spiny skink is roughly 20 centimetres long. It's a very cool little skink that has almost tiger stripes on its back. It lives in a single entrance burrow. In our research we've found that the skinks don't move very far from their burrow. They rarely venture more than about one metre away from the burrow entrance. Um, the females in particular, the males will move around, particularly during breeding season. So in late January to early February, the female will give birth to anywhere between one and, and four live babies. So we know that the babies often stay with the mother. After she's given birth to them, they'll stay in the home burrow and, and they'll sit on top of her back and dart out for food along with the mother. So we've been monitoring some of these skinks now for well over 10 years and some of the same animals are about 13 years old and at this stage we don't actually know how long they live for. We're guessing that it's probably in the range of about 15 to 20 years. The skink's quite spiny, which is where it gets its species name from, Nangura spinosa. So that, that indicates how spiny its body is and particularly its tail. It's almost crocodile-like in, in its appearance in some ways. So we, we find that the Nanga spiny skink is quite active in the dusk and dawn period, so between about when the sun sets and a couple of hours after. They're only found in this semi-invergreen vine thicket that I'm standing in today. We're not 100% sure why, but it's probably got a lot to do with the soil types and the climate, so it's quite a lot cooler. We also find a, a lot more invertebrate activity, which forms a, a really good part of their prey. Semi-evergreen vine thicket is characterised by lots of vines, obviously, but also it has a lot of hoop pine overstory as well. And historically, over 90% of this sort of habitat has been cleared throughout the Gympie region and, and beyond even. This species is listed as critically endangered under the Queensland and national legislation which gives it the highest amount of protection. The largest population where we are today is roughly 1,000 animals but it's still declining at the margins due to a number of threats. The national parks that the Nanga skink is found in both quite small now due to land clearing. Uh, one of them's less than a couple of hundred hectares of suitable habitat remaining. The larger area is closer to four or five hundred hectares. The two populations are separated by a large area of unsuitable habitat. Um, we know from genetic sequencing results that the two populations have been separated for somewhere in the vicinity of one million years. Within these national parks, the skinks are still under a number of threats. These include things from climate change, which is increasing the risk of fire and flooding. The forecast for this Gympie region is, is for increased fire weather conditions and increased drought periods with excessive rain periods following those droughts. Rainfall averages are dropping, um, which seems to have a trend of pushing a lot of particularly young Nanga spiny skinks down lower into drainage lines, presumably chasing moisture. And then in 2022, we saw extreme rainfall events that, that created flooding through those drainage lines, which washed away a number of the burrows that we had been monitoring. One of the other major threats to the Nanga spiny skink in both parks is the presence of predators, so cats, foxes, pigs and red deer. The Queensland Parks and Wildlife Service is working really hard to control a lot of these pest species within both national parks. From the monitoring we've found that 
really high densities of cat numbers within these vine forest areas. At the moment we have roughly 18 or 19 cats per square kilometre and our numbers are really quite high. So cats and foxes will directly predate on the, the skinks at their burrows. In areas where we don't have very many skinks, uh, we've placed cages over the top of the burrows which protect the skinks. The cages also stop trampling from red deer that move through these areas which introduce a lot of weed species as well. So weeds are also another big issue for the Nanga spiny skink. The understory of the semi evergreen vine thickets where the species occurs is generally quite open. Um, we have a couple of really nasty ecosystem modifying weeds, cat's claw creeper and coral berry which totally change that understory and, and close it out. The cat's claw creeper will climb the trees and, and eventually modify the ecosystem. It shades out the ground layer and prevents the skinks from being able to bask outside their burrow entrances. Coral berry does something very similar where it's, you end up with quite a sea of, of coral berry underneath the semi evergreen vine thicket. Another threat that we're still investing a lot of research into currently is the threat of disease. There's a lot of reptile diseases that are emerging within reptile populations right across Australia at the moment and a number knocking on the door of Australia as well. We're currently looking into what reptile diseases might be a threat for these Nanga spiny skinks and conduct regular health checks of both our captive population and some of these wild animals. So disease is one of the reasons why we don't disclose the location of where Nanga spiny skinks occur. Uh, we're trying to restrict the impact that any disease might have on, on these two really isolated populations and why we established the captive breeding program. Hi, my name's Lisa Owen and I've been managing the captive breeding program of the Nanga spiny skink for just over three years now. So in our captive breeding program, we've been moving males and females around each year to try and expand the genetic diversity of our juveniles. And given the size of them, it's really hard to identify the different animals um, when there's multiple in each bay. So we've been using different colours to identify them. However, we are just about to instigate some mini microchips being inserted here to identify the individuals. There's a lot we still don't know about these skinks, so we're doing some really exciting research um, on this captive breeding program. So we're monitoring the skinks in captivity. We've got cameras on each one of the bays and we've actually observed some really interesting behaviours over the last few years that we're going to look into more. One of the other interesting things that we've noted about these skinks is that they seem to be using some sort of capillary action to draw water. Um, by just standing in water, they can absorb water up onto their body and potentially into their mouths. So that could be one way that they're drinking water in the wild. Um, which then has a significant impact on their survivability out there, given climate change and a lot of those areas have been going through drought periods. So it's been a really successful captive breeding program so far. Over the three years we've now had approximately 92% survivorship for immature animals and about 80% survivorship for adult animals. I'm Tali, I'm one of the rangers here. I work day to day in managing and assisting with the husbandry of our captive skinks. Recently we have just done a release into the wild which is our first time for the program so we actually released four of our juveniles that have been born here in captivity along with two adults. What's been really great is one of those females that was actually released has now given birth in the wild so we've further contributed to that release making it eight now in total and here in our captive setting we have had 30 individuals born since starting the program so very positive for us given that we weren't sure if they would actually be able to breed in captivity. Personally it's been really exciting. I think it's been especially great to see a reptile gaining some focus and some traction around their importance. Um, so being able to contribute to the first reptile breed and release program in Queensland has been amazing. My name's Daryl Bell, I'm Queensland Parks and Wildlife Ranger. Uh, we're currently in the Nanga Skink Habitat doing some weed control work. We've got four land care staff working alongside Queensland Parks and Wildlife Rangers. We're using secateurs and chemical and then future projects will be focusing on the carpeted areas where we'll be targeting the cat's claw with spray packs, low impact spraying so we don't impact the Nanga Skink Habitat. Cat's claw is a vine, it's a very invasive vine that's 
dries up the trees, covers the trees completely, and as it gets older and older, the vines get thicker, and the weight of the vine will pull down the tree and open up the canopy, which will allow more cat's claw to come into the area. Bushfire management in the area, we undertake controlled burns in the cooler times of the month and also when there's high soil moisture in the ground. In 2019, we had a bushfire that came close to the Nangaskin Capitat. Rangers tied the fire into gullies using dozers and also a skid steer loader in the cooler conditions of the night time. Queensland Parks and Wildlife officers do control burns in the cooler time and we try to use Indigenous practices. Uh, my name is Matt Tucker, I'm a Natural Resource Management Ranger with the Queensland Parks and Wildlife Service for the Sunshine Coast area. My role initially involved trialling to emerging technology using artificial intelligence to targeting feral cats. The technology we use is called a Felixer, which is a cat grooming device. It uses the animal's grooming technique to take up a measured dose of 1080 toxin delivered in a uh, gel format. We ran the trial for approximately five months with uh, reasonably good success. We removed four individuals, feral cats and, and one fox. While we've probably found the device effective, it's definitely not a silver bullet. It's another tool which can be incorporated into an integrated pest control. I'm hopeful that the work we've done and, and, and the dedicated work that the guys are doing within this habitat play an important role in protecting the skink. Hi, I'm Dan Morgan, Coordinator of Environment Services for Gympie Regional Council. Gympie Regional Council has been aware of our special citizen, the Nanga spiny skink, for some time. Uh, Council has recently included the species in the threatened flora and fauna of the Gympie region, a handbook which we uh, dedicate to educating our public and our community. We have also been supporting our Land for Wildlife program and has a regional biodiversity protection approach. Council strengthened its commitment to biodiversity protection in 2022 through the implementation of a temporary local planning instrument, which is the protection of biodiversity values for our region. TLPI provides additional protection of native species through identifying and protection of environmental values, habitat and areas, and aims to protect and enhance core ecological linkages, priority species habitat, wetlands, waterways, and matters of local environmental significance. Uh, Council is currently reviewing our planning scheme and integrating those biodiversity protections. This will consider improvements arising from the application of our work over the past 12 months and consideration of the work that the Department of Environment Science. The department's captive breeding program and knowledge of species distribution is important to us and to our uh, landholders in the region to support them so that we can engage in further uh, land for wildlife programs or biodiversity and conservation activities. Hi, I'm Liz Hutchison. I'm part owner of a nature refuge west of Gympie with my husband, Glenn. We bought this property, we were looking for a fairly large acreage and when we were looking around, we identified this area and it came to us with already nature refuge on board and some people would uh, make it feel a little bit you know, daunting, but with the restrictions that you've got, but we have not found that at all. So many more people should try and do this as we are losing a lot of habitat around the place. We have a caveat that we have to mosaic burn, which is a way of controlling weeds and reducing fire load. We get help from our local people when we do that. But yeah, it's the weeds, it's the imported weeds, it's the lantana and rat's tail that are the really big things that everybody has to get onto. Like knowing that there's a couple, Nango Spiny Skink, here on the property, it's um, pretty special. And if you've got your grandkids with you and you spot them, it's better still. Our property is a buffer. A lot of this area was logged and, and it wasn't looked after. This area is amazing that it looks really dry at the moment, but with a little bit of rain it bounces back. But just trying to make sure that you've got that buffer from the road, you're keeping your place clean and, and it just gives a bit more to the National Park, I guess. We're keeping our place clean in order for it to stay clean. Wanyanullam, my name is Kerry Jones and my connection to country was from my great grandmother. I'm one of the seven applicants on the Cubby Cubby Native Title Board. Yeah, today is very exciting. Up in the hills up here, looking for the Nanga spiny skink, up in a lot of these ridge lines and that. Uh, very important places. These places were pathways for lots of different mob traveling through. 
to the Bunya Festival. A lot of different mobs were coming through this area, the coastal people, you know, people from wide, widely all over southeast Queensland to come to this awesome festival where trade was made, marriages, trading in tools, all that sort of business and bringing life back into a lot of our country. Aspiration for Cubby Cubby people to get people, a lot of the youth, a lot of the elderly back out on country, getting a lot of our people back in touch with a lot of our natural resource management, our vulnerable species and our fire management. We need to be connecting back to country, our young ones and that, you know, not just for the management of the land, but for how people think about land. And the only way you do that is being on country and observing your surroundings. It's so much better for your, you know, for your mind and your well-being. And how we manage this country is for the future. <laughs>